is to love Father Don Calloway. He's the man. So many times today we hear about Our Lady's requests from Medjugorje in particular, and all our Marian apparitions, of course, about the word conversion. Conversion. What does conversion mean? What is it all about? Father Don is the personification of conversion, to say the least. And I know in the course of his talk, he's going to touch on that very topic. Our Lady, our Heavenly Mother Mary, again, the intercessor, the vessel that was used, who was used for the conversion process of Father Don. He will include this in his presentation, as I say. He holds quite a number of theological degrees from the various colleges, universities, and has written several books which are available in the, uh, the where the vendors are set, and uh, has attended conferences throughout the world and very much sought after, to say the least. So it gives me great, great pleasure once again to be with this man, man of God, man of Our Lady, and to present him to you, Father Don Calloway. So I will be going into your lunchtime, but that's okay because I'm going to feed your soul. Okay, so <laughs> food, it's good, it's good, but um, the, the teaching is, is, is better. So, okay, so what I'm going to do before I start though, um, and maybe you're noticing a big stain on me, I spilled coffee all over myself a little while ago. <laughs> this is why we wear black, by the way, and it helps cover those things up. If I gain weight, it just covers it too, so that's good. Okay, so first, um, some people are going to help me, they're going to hand out these, okay? Now, what these are are the pilgrimages that I do. I know they do them here as well, so I don't want to take away from that. But I hand these out because my religious community right now, I have, I'm the vocation director. We have 41 seminarians right now. Oh. Yeah, that's amazing. And they're all Orthodox, solid, Marian, Eucharistic. They're on fire, guys. But it's a big problem for us. Imagine if you had 41 children that you were sending to college. That's a huge bill. So by doing these pilgrimages, which my superior allows me to do, I'm able to help you know, bring funds back to the community and everything. And I go on each one of these. So please check them out. Okay, a lot of people, they're like, Father, do you go? I'm like, yeah, I don't put you on a plane and send you over to Europe. See ya, you know. <laughs> so it's a blessing for me too. I get renewed and I do a whole bunch of them. It's on the front and back. Um, and my mom goes on quite a few of them as well. And my mom is the saint in this, not me. My mom is a holy woman. So if you want to meet my mom, uh, go on one of these pilgrimages with us. The website is there, but in case you don't get one, if there's not enough of them, just go to the website, okay? Uh, FatherCalloway.com, and, you, and you'll see that. So please, please, please pray about coming. Doesn't mean, just because you're from Canada, doesn't mean you can't come with the American group, okay? We're friends, we get along, okay? All right, and then also the books that I have are here for sale. I'll be here all day signing and selling books. We'll probably run out, but no biggie. You can get them. They're actually cheaper online. Um, <laughs> so I hate saying that. I shouldn't be saying that. We need the money, but nonetheless, you know, um, get them online cheaper. Okay, so how many of you have heard about my story, the conversion story? Okay, quite a few of you. How many of you have not? No shame. Okay, shame on you. <laughs> it I'm nobody. It's not about me. It's not about me. It really isn't. What I want you to remember as you hear this talk, because uh, I'll give a talk on the rosary in the afternoon, is that it's not about me. I'm nobody special. I am a sinner just like everybody else. I put my pants on in the morning like everybody else does, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm not a saint. I want to be like a shark to meat, but it, it's a process. So keep your delinquent children in mind when I give this talk. Because if you think that they're bad, I'm going to make them look like saints, <laughs> you know, once you hear my story. And if your marriage is jacked up, you know, then I hope to give you hope. Because it's a hurting world right now, everywhere I go, it's, you know, there's hardly a leave it to me for family left. 
you know, if you know what I'm saying when I say that, young people might not, I'm dating myself now when I say these things. We need hope, big time. So that's what I want to instill in you. That's what I want to give you. Um, okay, so to start this, you see me up here as a priest, right? And uh, hopefully I look normal. I don't look like I've done nasty, horrible, sinful, criminal things in my past. You wouldn't know. You know, I meet people in airports, and, and they just think I'm some priest sitting next to them. And a lot of times that you freaks them out. You know, they don't. It is funny. Me in airports, it, it's it's funny stuff. A lot of people panic. They think I'm going to turn to them and be like, recite the commandments. You know, they just freak. You know? you can, the tension is there. You can see it. They're just staring straight ahead. I'm like, dude, loosen up, soldier. At least. You know, so, you know, they just freak out because they haven't been living a moral life. And a priest sits next to them. They're like... Oh, but a lot of people are actually, I would say most people are actually happy that I'm on their plane. <laughs> you know, they think it's going to crash because there's a priest on there. That's the guarantee. You know, I'm happy when there's a nun on my plane. You know, it's like, right of Christ is here. We're not going down today. You know, um, but they see me and they don't, they don't know my story. So if we do start a conversation, you know, they're like, where are you from, Father? And I'll tell them. And they're like, oh, so what's your past? And they automatically assume that I come from a homeschooled family where my mom was Mary, my dad was Joseph, and I have 14 brothers and sisters, and I was confirmed by the Pope. You know, and that's, that's the life of a, of a young man who discerns to become a priest. Well, that would be great, but that's not my case, and that's not most cases, especially today. So when I was born, uh, my parents were not Catholic, they were not Christians of any kind, they were not Buddhist, they were not Taoist, Shinto, nothing. They didn't believe in anything. And so I wasn't baptized. My mom was a very worldly woman at that time, and a um, very beautiful woman. And she married a guy, then she got a divorce. I never really knew my biological father until much, much later. She remarried another guy, they got a divorce, and then she remarried again. So before I was nine years old, I had three fathers. Yeah, uh, it's sad, actually. Uh, I mean, none of them were St. Joseph, by the way. They were, they were, you know, they were into it for their own sensual gratification. So when my mom married the third time, my third father, my stepfather, and not, when I say dad now, I'm referring to dad number three, he adopted me, so I got his last name. Remember what my, what my last name is? Calloway. Calloway, right? So that, that's awesome. I love that last name. Because up until that time, I had my biological father's last name, which was, he's now deceased, but his last name was Croc. <laughs> yeah. Brutal! You know? So I was like, thank you, Jesus. I got adopted, you know? So I, I get the last name Calloway. I, uh, I mean, it's a, unless Croc is your last name, it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he adopts me and then I get baptized 10 years old I get baptized why because they wanted to do it no because his parents my new grandparents and I got grandparents all over the place with three dads you know, they said you adopted that kid you've got to get him baptized the boy hasn't been baptized but my parents weren't into this they were like no we don't do church it's, we're not into that but grandparents being grandparents they just kept nagging you know get him baptized get him baptized get him baptized so finally they went and found a church where there was no preparation needed you know no sponsors required and all that kind of stuff and so they went and found an Episcopalian church where they got me baptized in Virginia Beach Virginia at the time how many relatives were invited none how many pictures were taken? None. Why waste film on this? All they wanted was the little 8x11 certificate that would show been baptized. They would give it to the grandparents, basically shut up, zip it, be happy. Okay, we got them baptized. Stop talking about religion. So we never went to church after that. My experience of Christianity, my introduction to Christianity was going to some dude dressed in like a robe who poured water over my face. And then we went outside around a picnic table and ate donuts. That was my baptism experience. That was church. Okay. So, you know, we never went back to church, and we started moving a lot. My stepfather was in the Navy, so we moved like every two to three years. We moved from Virginia Beach to Los Angeles. Living there was awesome for me. It was the early uh, 1980s, where MTV had just come out. Now you could not just hear music, you could see music. The videos were visual now, so if there was any, you know, misunderstanding of what the Hot for Teacher song was about, well, it was very clear when you watched the video, you know. And so I was loving this. This is Southern California. This is awesome. Then we moved to San Diego, which is America's finest city. That's the logo for the city. And it is. Um, you know, nothing against Detroit or anything, you know, but I was actually born in Dearborn, uh, Michigan, which is called Islamabad now, basically. So 
But San Diego is like cream of the crop. Best weather in basically North America. I mean, it's such a great place. So living there, I, I bit onto the culture big time. And what that meant was I started, you know, drinking and smoking weed and looking at Mrs. January, February, and March, okay? <laughs> Not with a mouse click, because that wasn't in vogue yet. That wasn't around, but, you know, in magazines and stuff. And I became wicked. I wouldn't have said that back then, but my heart was messed up. And so were all my friends. I didn't have one friend or family that I knew that were devout, you know, Christians. I, none. Why? Because all my generation was taught, really and truly, and I mean this 100%. If you could replay the video of my life and watch how I was educated, and all my generation was educated, it was basically, told, we were told this, in, in science class, in history class, they would sneak it even into math somehow, that all we are is a bunch of monkeys. You're a monkey, dude. So... Religion is stupid, especially Christianity, because what a pity that this Jesus character became one of us when we're moving on from this. We, we came from starfish, we developed into maybe dolphins or something, and now we're this thing called human, but we're moving on. And see, that's how it's defined today. We're in the post-human era. We're in the era of the androgynous human beings. I mean, there are children today who don't, are, don't, are told by adults that they, don't, they, they can use whichever bathroom they want. You guys know this very well in yeah. Canada, very well. Okay. Uh, we got our own problems sit down south of you, but you guys up here, you know, you got some serious issues. <laughs> you know, I hate to say that, but you know, don't kill me when I walk out of here. But I hear about what your leader is doing. Woo! <laughs> Nuts! Okay. So I'm probably going to kick out of here, by the way, by the end of this. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I know you would because it's true. I mean, what the heck is going on? You know. So, but that, that's how I, I was educated with that same kind of mentality, and so I thought, yeah. All religions are stupid, but especially Christianity. I mean, what a pity, you know, that God would become one of us when we're moving on. Why become a man when we're going to become something else? We're leaving you behind. Christianity, we're going to leave that in the dust because that's some stupid, antiquated, outdated, unscientific, moronic institution that hasn't updated with the times. Catholicism was the most stupidest thing ever to me growing up. It made no sense whatsoever because that's what my teachers, all my teachers, told us. As a matter of fact, even in the textbooks, you know, time was no longer defined by, by Jesus. Take a look at your kids' textbooks. I bet you it doesn't have A.D. in there anymore. Anno Domini. It's C.E. now. The common era. I call it the common error. You know, that's what it is. You know, you kid got out and you just replace it with whatever you want to. So that's how I grew up. Did I hear about Jesus? Of course I heard about Jesus. I, you have to be living on Pluto not to have heard about Jesus. But the Jesus that I was given the impression of is he's a cartoon. And it's, it's a fairy tale. It's, it's mythological. It's, 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 it's not real. See, as a young boy growing up in the United States, I'm sure it was the same thing here. On Saturday and Sunday mornings when I grew up, there was Popeye, Scooby-Doo, Bugs Bunny, and Preacher Man talking about a guy who walked on water and rose from the dead. Right. Just like the coyote gets the anvil thrown on his head a million times in those cartoons. He never dies. He always comes back to life. But if a grown man grows up, if a guy grows up and thinks that that's real... You need meds, you need medication, you need counseling, you need some serious inpatient therapy, okay, if you think that, that, that there is a, a real Bugs Bunny, okay, out there. Well, it's the same thing between the cartoons, flipping the channels, I'd see the preacher man holding a Bible, you know, glory, glory, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus, and they would, you know, all that nonsense, and they would, they would say, put your hand to the TV, be healed, be healed, 1-800, give me all your money so I can pay for my wife's makeup, okay. That was Christianity. It was these people never grew up. They actually think that somebody walks on water. Crazy. They actually think that some dude 2,000 years ago rose from the dead. Crazy. These are children who never grew up, and now they're hard up for cash, and they're just 1-800, you know, help me out, basically. That was Christianity to me. And all my friends, stupid religion, of all religions, you know, if you had to become one, maybe you could dabble in, you know, Zen or, or this or that, you know. But Christianity, for absolute idiots. So, that's how I was raised. So I latched onto the culture, and it got me big time. got me big time. We moved to Japan. Remember, third father is a military officer. We moved to Japan. I get there. I don't want to be in Japan initially. I fell in love with it after a while. But initially, I didn't want to be there because they took me out of Southern California. I went into rebellion mode, fifth overdrive. I looked for all the kids who looked back. Right? Today, everybody's like, oh, no, you can't, you know, you can't say... 
We are so PC today, it's hilarious. I mean, we're so afraid of offending anybody that we're, we, we can't even call a spade a spade. Look, back in the day, if I saw a dude sporting an Iron Maiden shirt and had you know, tats and earrings, chances are he's not praying the rosary. Good, good chance, you know. If I see a girl who's basically so unaffirmed that she's wearing dental floss to get the attention of boys, that girl got daddy issues. All I got to do is affirm that little girl and tell her she's beautiful. I got whatever I want. It ain't rocket science. But today everybody's like, oh, how dare you say that the shirt's, the skirt is too short or whatever it's her choice and yada, yada, yada. You guys <laughs> crack me up. We have so lost our ability to think that we've become stupid. We really have. I mean... There's a quote from uh, Chesterton that, that I love. Have you ever heard this one? Because he everybody says, like, oh, you're closed-minded. You're not open-minded. Well, Chesterton says, don't be so open-minded that your brains fall out. Okay? Because <laughs> they will. And that's what we've had. What's happened today? You know, everywhere. Everybody's we're just stupid today. So back in the day, it was obvious to me how you would look for the bad kids. And, and sure enough, I found them over there. So I got involved with them, and I stopped going to school, and I started doing other hard drugs, really hard drugs in Japan. Eventually, I ran away from home on the big island of Honshu, if you know anything about Japan, it's the big one in the middle. I got involved in an organization called the Yakuza, the Yakuza. It's the Japanese mafia. I was 15 years old, okay, Caucasian kid, running free in Japan with a criminal organization where I had everything I wanted. I had beautiful Asian women on my left and on my right. I was 15, okay? It was unbelievable the things that I was doing. I had so much money on me, and yen, it always sounds more, you've got a million yen. It doesn't mean you got a million, well, US dollars or even Canadian, but it's, it's still, you know, $15,000 in cash or so, and I, I, I loved it. It was awesome for me, and I wanted to stay in Japan for the rest of my life. But what I didn't know is that I, ca I was causing an international scene I was being tracked down by the American government, the Japanese government, and the American military presence in Japan. I was just, I was causing a whole scene. So eventually, uh, what I didn't know is that my mother was having a crisis. Her third marriage was now on the rocks because they're arguing about me. My dad, my stepfather's taking heat from his superiors in the military. And uh, my mom's on medication for stress, anxiety, depression. What I did not know also was that my mother had a friend in Japan. And this is where the story gets just amazing, because if there's one thing in life that you don't mess with, okay, and you know this, and there's many of you here, one thing in life you don't mess with is a Catholic Filipino woman, okay? <laughs> they will take you down. They are the special forces in the spiritual life. They are green berets. They are, they mean business, okay? I mean, they're just amazing people. Wherever there's one Filipino, there's a hundred more coming. That's just how they operate. <laughs> Auntie and uncle, all of them going to be living in a house soon, you know. And wherever they go, they bring Catholicism. Where, ask a random Filipino woman on the street to open her purse. I bet you she's got a novena or two in there, okay? It's like Filipinos are born, they're issued a novena. You know, that's just how it works over in Manila, you know. So, so they're just awesome people. One-tenth of all Filipinos don't even live in the Philippines right now. They're all around the world. And wherever they go, they establish Catholicism. They're just amazing. So this, my mom had a friend in Japan that I would find out much later. She said to my mother this. Now, I'm, I'm not making fun of Filipinos. I love you people, okay? Had I not become a priest, I would have married a Filipina, okay? <laughs> if that's not good enough for you, I pray the next pope is a Filipino, okay? I love you people, okay? Salamat po to your culture and everything, okay? I love you people. But when you speak English, it sounds a little funny. <laughs> to a white boy's ear, okay? So, my mom had a Filipino friend over there because this Filipino woman married an American GI, you know how the story goes. So this woman said to my mom, I know what you got to do. You got to talk to butter. You got to talk to butter. Right, they get the P's and the D's, get a little you know. So, my mom, who's 100% Italian, why was she not Catholic, right? She wasn't. So she's like, why do I have to talk to a priest? You know, I, that's not going to help me. But Filipino women don't give up. They will nag you until you do what they tell you to do. So this Filipino woman kept saying to my mother, you got to talk to him, talk to him. Right? So my mom is like, fine. So she goes reluctantly to talk to a Catholic priest on the military installation. I didn't know any of this. Well, that priest changed my mom's life. 
He told my mom about hardcore, in-your-face Catholicism. Not crayon Catholicism, not cafeteria Catholicism. Hardcore, in-your-face Catholicism. About the Eucharist. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have life. About confession. Basically, the best counseling psychology known to man, and it's free. You know, my mom had been taking so much, so much meds to try and heal her maternal heart, but there's no pill that's going to heal a maternal broken heart. It can maybe help, but it's not going to get to the root of it. So he changed my mom's life, and he told my mom about a wicked boy named Augustine who had a mother named Monica, and that whole dynamic, and that gave her like a lot of hope, you know. And so she signed up to become a Catholic. I didn't know that, right? Well, what happened was she had to leave the country before any of that could be realized because the government said, you have to leave with your other son, my half-brother. When we find your son and deport him, hopefully alive and not in a body bag, we have to have a place to send him. So my mother was no longer even living in the country. I was gone for a long time. So when they finally apprehended me, they kicked me out of the country, literally. I was uh, handcuffed behind my back, chained on my feet, escorted by two military police officers from Yokosuka, which is a big base there, to Honolulu, where they put me on a commercial flight. I could tell you an amazing story about a guy I just met two weeks ago that saw that happen 30 years ago. It's amazing. It, it'll blow your mind. It, it, it's going to be written up in, a, in an article coming up soon. It's just a mind-blowing. So there I am, being asked, kicked out of the country, go back to the States. We fly to LAX. They take the handcuffs and chain off. They give me into the custody of my father because I wasn't 18. I hadn't done any criminal activity on American soil. What do they do with this kid? I, I, they can't lock me, incarcerate me in the United States. I ain't done anything on American soil. Tricky situation. So we fly to Pennsylvania where my mother is now living. And to my shame, there I am, long hair. This is what I look like at this time, okay? Now, I'm not a narcissist, okay? I'm working on my pride, but I do carry a big picture of myself all around the world. Okay? It's just so that you can see it, okay? All right, so that was me. You left that. All, all my girlfriends, oh, you can see it up there, I don't have to. All my girlfriends were jealous, if you call them girlfriends, because my hair was longer than theirs. My hair in this picture is short. When it was at its ultimate length, when I was going on 21, it was all the way down to my belt. Wow. All of it. Bangs and everything, you know. Um, it's funny because when I did eventually cut it, I grew my hair for like seven years straight. I had wicked split ends all the way to the roots, but, you know. Um, when I eventually cut my hair, I had that whole phantom thing going on. For a month, I was going like this. You know? <laughs> there you go. It, was, it always was there, you know. So, that's what I looked like at this point. And... There's my mom at the airport, pre-9-11, anybody can come to the gate. She comes over to me, exuding motherhood all over me. Donnie, Donnie, I love you. You know what I did? It pains me even to say it to this day. I pushed my mom away from me, practically almost knocking her down. I put my finger in her face right in front of everybody in the airport, and I said, I hate your guts. And I meant it. I hated her. And that woman broke right in front of me and everybody else. She cried so uncontrollably. I broke my mom's heart. We get into the car, and I'm like, what are we doing? Where are we going? And my dad says, you're going to a rehab. And I'm like, good, because it will get me away from you. See, in the airport, I put a dagger in my mom's heart. In the car, I turned it and ripped her guts out emotionally. I broke that woman. So we get into the car. I go to my first rehab in Altoona, Pennsylvania. It's called New Beginnings at Cove Forge. You can look it up. I'm there for three months. It was a joke. It was a band-aid to a spiritual problem. Not because I wanted to be there. I didn't want to be there. But their method was laughable. I mean, I hate to tell you this, I really do. I, I, maybe you're already aware of it. But studies have been shown that up to 90% of people who go to secular rehabs have a failure rate. Really? Why? I mean, aren't these the people with the PhDs and all, all the knowledge? Yeah, not really. They really don't know what they're doing. All they want you to do is make a good showing and be a sober monkey. That's all. They don't offer you anything more. If all they want you to do is don't look, just don't snort the sugar, don't smoke the banana, you know, just, but you're still a monkey. Whoop do you do? I mean, if that's all you're offering, who cares? I mean, sobriety is good for sure, but that's not the ultimate goal. Holiness is the ultimate goal. So, so many people get out of there, they relapse so quickly, or their sponsor does, and they lose their chip status. Then they got to start from zero and start doing it again. It, it, man, oh man, it's a disaster. A disaster. So that was my first experience. I learned how to do more drugs in the rehab. I was scandalized by the people in the rehab. Sure, my counselors were, weren't token up, but they were filthy perverts just like I was. Did they not think that I heard their conversations in the employee lounge when the male counselors were talking about the backside of the female counselors the same way that I would? 
Mm. And you're here to help me? Interesting. Do you not think that I don't see that rainbow on your bumper sticker in the parking lot? You think I don't see that? Really? You, you, and you're here to help me find, get a different life? Get a life. I mean, you, you guys should be in here too. Didn't help at all. It didn't help one single person that I met in there. Every single one of them relapsed. So I get out and I got nowhere to go. So I go to my parents' house. Guess what's happening now? My mom says to me, Donnie, while you were away, your father and I have become Catholic. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> you're gonna find you're following Jim Jones, you're gonna drink the Kool-Aid in Guyana and off yourself. That's that's what Catholicism is to me. It's a cult where you follow little green men and some weird dude who lives in Italy and wears white. That's what Catholicism was to me. You guys are the stupidest people of everyone. I can't believe you've been suckered into this stupid religion. This is embarrassing. I couldn't stay with them. Because every time my parents ate a cracker, they would stop. Bless us, oh Lord. I'm like, just eat the cracker, man. What's wrong with you people, man? You guys are freaks. What's wrong with you? You're praying to, you know, the, the spaghetti monster in the sky. You know, what are you talking about, man? So I couldn't stay in there. Because my mom, she turned the house into a church. She found these figurines, little ones, medium-sized, gigantic ones, <laughs> of some dude, like, ripped. He had, like, a six-pack. He had wings. He was stabbing a snake in the face with, like, a pitchfork or something, just grinding it into his forehead. I don't know what that alien is, you know. But she put these things in my pocket, my pants pocket. I'd, I'd come home, bombed out of my mind, and put my pants on, and, and there'd be this stiff thing with this St. Michael the Archangel thing. You know, I'd be like, Mom's cuckoo for Cocoa Pops, you know. They're, they're, they're nuts. They're nuts. So I couldn't stay in their house, so I left. I ended up following a band called The Grateful Dead, um, old hippie band, you know, and I went to all these shows all over the place. I got a tattoo called Steal Your Face on my shoulder. It's the lightning bolt through a skull. Most young people don't know what that is today. So it was nuts. It was crazy life. I mean, I talked to turtles, man, okay? I, 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 seriously, I, I did so much acid and mushrooms at that time that it's a miracle that I have my mental faculties right now. I was fried, perpetually baked on this stuff. Every day. If I wasn't coming down while well, I was getting some to get back up, you know, it was, it was a crazy life. So eventually I, I woke up in, 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 in a, in a, on a gurney in Louisiana and got uh, taken to a, a jail because I got caught shoplifting from a store called Piggly Wiggly where I was jacked up on coke and tried to beat up the cop. And, you know, so they threw me in jail. I got out. I didn't go to my court date. You know, I'm not interested in laws. So I go back to West Virginia to find Papa Croc. Remember, my biological father. Because my mom always told me, avoid that man. He's nothing but trouble. So I'm like, well, now would be a good time to meet him because they're looking for me in Louisiana with the police and everything. And they're like hillbillies, okay? And really and truly, if you don't know what a redneck is, go to West Virginia, okay? I can say that because these are my people. They speak English, I think. Okay, I mean, they're the real deal. They're just a wee bit shy of suspenders, a banjo, and da -da 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 -da. You know? These are my people. I love them, but it's different, okay? So I meet my biological father for the first time. We don't get along. He's raw hillbilly. He just, you know, watches NASCAR all day, drinks beer, and, you know, I'm all into hard metal and, you know, all this, these drugs and everything. So he doesn't even want me in his house, but he lets me live on his land. They, got, they own so many acres there. So I live out there until my supplies run out. I come back. He didn't, doesn't want me in the house still. I go back to my mom's house in Pennsylvania. Guess what's going on now? They're going to church every day. <laughs> every day. When I last saw them, they were going on Sundays. Now they're getting up every morning, having a cup of coffee, and going off to church. They enrolled my brother in a Catholic school, which in my you know, history channel mind means he's being beaten over the face by nuns with a ruler, indoctrinated, you know, and basically having his brain washed with a bunch of nonsense. That's what I thought. I'm like, this is insane. You people are growing more nuts by the minute. I can't believe this. So I couldn't stay there, so I left. I'm doing my own thing, hitchhiking around. Till I go to another rehab because I woke up on the streets of Philadelphia after having done so much crap that I, I, my heart was about ready to blow up. So I go to another rehab, which is a psychiatric unit, Charter Fairmont Institute. It's a lockdown padded facility where if you don't cooperate with the program, they put you in a padded room and they just keep upping the milligrams of your little Dixie cup medicine until you cooperate with the program. So I, I was in a nut house basically for three months. So I get out of there. I try and go back to my parents' house. I can't do it. It's just, they're, they're so into religion. I'm doing my own thing until I have a serious crisis. I had friends who had died, friends who were incarcerated, friends who had lost their mind from the drugs. 
they're, some of them are still alive, but they're not here mentally. They're, they're gone. They're dancing with the bears. I mean, they drool on their chin. They don't know their nose and their toe because they did some bad stuff. So I'm back at my parents' house on one occasion, and there wasn't even a bedroom for me because I was hardly ever there. There was a room, like an extended storage area that had a love seat in it where I would crash when I was in town. So I'm there one night. My dad is on an uh, aircraft carrier halfway around the world, and people are calling me, and they're like, dude, let's go out. You know, We'll meet you by the pier because they had moved again. They were back in Norfolk, Virginia, Virginia Beach area. And I'm like, dude, no. Not because I wanted to be saved, not because I wanted to encounter Jesus. That was the last thing on my mind. You know what I was thinking about doing? I'm done. I hate life. I hate it. This monkey, I've done everything. I've had my banana, okay? I've done it with all kind of other monkeys, beautiful shapes, sizes, and colors, and nationalities. Now what? If this is just a cosmic rock going nowhere with no meaning, purpose, a deity that has a plan, this is horrible. I don't want to be here anymore. So I'm thinking about taking my own life. So, guess what I heard in my room, in that that room? For the first time in about 10 years, you're going to hear it right now, exactly what I heard. This. Nothing. Absolute silence. I had always been in in a room with music, uh, video game going, or TV on, or whatever. Always, always, always. Now, there was silence in there, and I freaked out. The silence was loud. It's really weird, but it was loud. Panicked. I went out to the hallway, because my buddies are wasted on a beach at this point. I've done messed it up, you know, me and my stupid ideas. So, I go out to the hallway to look at the National Geographic. Get my mind off, you know, the silence. I'm scoping for yellow books, because they're yellow, right? So, I'm like, there's none. There's one. I pull it out. It's not a National Geographic, but it's yellow binding, and it says this. really strange. It says... The Queen of Peace visits Meju Giji Gorgiji. Gorgiji Right? What is that? The Meju Juju. I don't know what that is. You know? So I'm like, okay. So I pull it out and I can see it's got something to do with Christianity. There's some babushka looking lady on there, barefoot on a rocky cliff. I'm like, lady, get some shoes. You know, I don't know what's going on. And I'm like, oh, aha. This is probably the cult manual that my parents got that suckered them into becoming one of these morons. So let's, let's dig into this. Let's see what these people are into. So I go in there. I shut the door. I sit in the love seat. I look at the pictures in the middle. I'm not into reading. I just want to see what the pictures are doing. I see you know, little kids on their knees in some karate position in front of a table full of necklaces. And they're, they're looking up in the air like they had just toked up a fat one. They were like... <laughs> Stone, right? So I'm like, what? And then I tried to read the captions, and I thought one of the girls' names was marijuana. <laughs> that's what it looked like, you know? 